I'd like to call to order the Rutherford County School System regular work meeting, April 4th, 2024. We have the Pledge of Allegiance, and Mr. Coy Young has that for us tonight. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you tonight Oakland FFA. Please join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Ms. Braden? Yes. Stuart. Good. Hi, how are you? Come on up. I'm good. How are you all? Well, good afternoon. I'm Gina Stewart, and I'm one of five ag teachers at Oakland High School. And tonight, we just want to share a little bit about our students and their success and a little bit about our programs. I work with Caitlin Law Liberty, Bridget Vaughn, Blake Warmack, and Dr. James Scott. Uh, my grandfather was a commercial cattle producer and a banker all his life. He used to tell me, once in your life, you need a doctor, lawyer, and a policeman. Every day, three times a day, you need a farmer. That is why we are so passionate about agriculture education. At Oakland High School, we are excited to have a continuously growing agriculture program where we focus on teaching four main pathways, animal science, plant science, agriculture mechanics, and ag business. This includes lab spaces for dog grooming, small animal care, an ag mechanic shop, and two greenhouses. We are also working on our large animal science academy that we expect to open this fall. While our roots are in agriculture, we also focus on leadership through FFA formerly known as Future Farmers of America. FFA is the largest youth organization in the country. And this year, Oakland FFA has 429 FFA members. Through our organization, we focus on youth leadership. And the students standing in front of you have mastered that. I would like to take a minute and recognize each of our students who excelled as a state winner at this year's state FFA convention over spring break. Hannah Harrell retired as the Tennessee State FFA Treasurer. She served along seven other women, and it's only the third time in FFA history for an all-women state FFA officer team. She retired after serving her year of service. Additionally, we have the state champion agriculture issues team. That team was comprised of Lily Amstutz, Annabelle Alexis, Abby DeBerry, Anna Grace Wells, Kira Klaparik, Emma Milliken, and Julian Floyd. Those students presented the pros and cons of an agricultural issue and were regional champions and state winners. We also had the champion bullpen challenge competition. Team members were Annabeth Cruz and Madeline Metters. They put together a business plan about, um, with their company, Morning Flowers. They were awarded a $750 award for their state championship. We also had a state winning proficiency in forage production, and that was Ashton Reed with his uh, forage production SAE project that he's had over the last five years where he worked with his grandfather on their family farm. We also had three state winners in agri-science fair. Social systems was Emma Goff, in environmental systems, Ezra Hall, and in power structure and technical systems, Lily Amstutz. Lily also competed this week at the MTSU STEM Expo where she won overall championship honors for her efforts. Finally, we had state degree recipients, Anna Grace Wells, Kira Klaparik, Emma Marcos, and Savannah Dart. All of these students will represent Rutherford County at Nationals in November. Thank you for recognizing them at the board. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. That's a little bit different, and we love it when it's a little bit different. I just want to recognize one of our oldest, oldest CTE uh, courses out there, and, and these guys do a remarkable job. If you ever get the opportunity to go to one of their competitions, you need to do that. Imagine it would be thrilling. We'll wait until they get out in the hall. Here we go. We're going to have a moment of silence before we do. I would like for you all to remember Horace Young, Coy Young's father, who passed away recently. Please keep this family in your prayers. Thank you. We 
We are now on number four, approval of the agenda. Move to approve. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Is there anyone wishing to abstain? The agenda is now approved. We are looking at number five, the renewal and extension of the director's contract. On March 20th, I announced we would begin contract negotiations for a renewal extension of Dr. Sullivan's contract. The floor is now open. Ms. Branton? Yes, ma'am. I would like to move to approve the contract as presented. Okay. According to Robert's Rules of Order, we can either do motion discussion or discussion motion. You want to do motion discussion? Yes, do I have a second? Second. We will now open the floor for discussion. Ms. Darby. Uh, some things that we did talk about on Tuesday, um, but some things we didn't really get a chance to really go into. And I had a couple of questions. Um, I know uh, Mr. Young and Ms. Sharp were on the board as well as you, Ms. Bratton, with the previous director. And Ms. Maxwell. And Ms. Maxwell, do you guys remember the time for, I don't think you and uh, Ms. Bratton and Ms. Maxwell were on there when they did the extension for Mr. Spurlock. No, we were remember not. Remember we were not. We were the time not. frame? You're right. We did a two year extension. Um, I know that at his extension meeting, Dr. Sullivan spoke um, in a very complimentary manner of Mr. Spurlock, if I were to quote, it would say the direct impact Mr. Spurlock's vision makes not just on our instruction department, but indirectly on our teachers and principals is second to none. Um, I'm curious, after approving the extension and everybody seeming to be on board, if anybody can speak to why there was a wish to replace Mr. Spurlock. Mr. Reed, would you come to the podium? Would you like to answer that question? Uh, <clears throat> I think um, <clears throat> um, there was, I guess, some issues between that were raised uh, by board members <clears throat> as <clears throat> pertained to the uh, prior director of schools and those emerged after the contract re renewal and um, after discussion with the then sitting director and the board at the time um, it was decided that it was best to probably amend the contract to have his term terminate one year early and that was the agreement that was made at that time okay <laughs> um, i'm going to call it point of order because this contract that we're talking about is not about the previous superintendent and what was in the past is in the past. We're talking about a contract with a whole new different superintendent that we have now. And the vote is- If you'll allow me to finish Ms. Rosales, I'm getting there. To move forward with the contract for Dr. Sullivan. So therefore, I call it a point of order that is out of procedure because we're not dealing with a contract of someone that's in the past, we're dealing with a contract that is pertinent to the person that's sitting there right now today. Well, I agree with you. I'm going to overrule your point of order, and I'm going to let Ms. Darby finish. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. I bring all of this up to bring awareness to the fact that things change, and there are no guarantees. Um, an extension or new contract, the extension for the previous director's contract took place about a year and a half into his contract, which is the same place that we're currently in. And within a little over two years, things had changed. Uh, that ended up costing the district almost $200,000 to get out of that contract. Metro Nashville went through something similar that was $350,000. If for some reason, and I'll reiterate again, and Dr. Sullivan knows this because him and I spoke before the meeting, it doesn't matter whose name is on the contract for me. We're charged with a board to approve contracts. In looking at this contract, 
regardless of whose name is on it. If for some reason something changed and the board felt they needed to make a change, depending on where that falls, it could cost the district close to a million dollars or more, depending on when that happens. For me as a board member, that's something I have to take into consideration. Um, a good contract like we spoke about at our work session is a give and take on both sides. It's a compromise. We were asked to submit changes we would like to see. There were no changes implemented. It is virtually the same contract that existed when Mr. Spurlock was here. I can only speak for myself, but I would like to think that this entire board would like to give Dr. Sullivan a new contract at four years. I just think we're asking for a discussion and some compromise and working together on something that represents the district well and represents Dr. Sullivan well. The contract in and of itself for me is the issue. Um, I know you mentioned good faith when we spoke on Tuesday. Good faith runs both ways. I don't believe I have heard anything about Dr. Sullivan wanting to leave or any of us wanting him to leave. I very much at this point would like to see him stay. I just think the contract needs to speak to what makes sense for the district. It's not a reflection on the job he's doing. He's doing a great job. I'll state again. It doesn't matter whose name is on the contract. The contract has to be a good contract. Um, in my opinion. So I, there are some things on this contract. I talked about them Tuesday. I'm not going to waste everybody's time with talking about them again. Um, it's just a shame to me that we talk about trying to work together, trying to come to compromises and, and all of those things. And yet this is a case in which that wasn't done. The contract was discussed and asked for input, but to my knowledge that input wasn't, it wasn't implemented for sure. I don't know if it was considered because I wasn't privy to those conversations. Was considered. Anyone else? I think it does matter whose name's on the contract. I wasn't there before. I wasn't seated. But I am more than ready to reward the great job that Dr. Sullivan has done because it says Dr. Jimmy Sullivan on it, not the former superintendent. And I want to reward him and make sure we lock him up. There are no guarantees in this world, but he deserves it. He has moved heaven and earth for this district and taken us through out of COVID, when we were in a terrible, terrible place, morale was as low as I have ever, ever seen. I was there. I was in the schools. I know how bad it was. And I want to thank him for this. And so it does matter whose name's on the contract. And I am very proud to vote to extend his contract of Dr. Jimmy Sullivan tonight. Ms. Sharp. Ms. Sharp, Ms. Sharp asks first, and then I'll come uh, back to you. I, I agree with um, Ms. Darby. We have not done our due diligence. And Dr. Sullivan and I worked together. We both came in. I as chair, he as director. We had a fabulous year. This is not about his job performance. This is about doing our due diligence. This is about setting a precedent of giving an extension on a contract before he even has his yearly review, which is not due until June. Granted, I, I guarantee there's principals out there, and the principals have teachers that they would love to lock up, as Ms. Maxwell says, but we're setting a precedence of renewing his contract before his second year review is even done. It's not about his performance. It's about procedures and policy. Mr. Tidwell, did you want to say something? I didn't know if you... It was, yes. Okay. I saw Ms. Sharp go up there, yeah. and then I think Mr. Gonzalez okay. wanted to speak as well. Uh, yeah, so at the work session, I brought up the same thing um, about the termination clause, and that's, that's really the biggest thing for me. Um, I mean, I've I had a great uh, relationship working with Dr. Sullivan. I really appreciate that. Um, certainly doesn't have anything to do with that, but I wouldn't sign this contract for my dad. Um, the issue with this as I mentioned at the work session, which I'll just go back over real quickly here, is we go to termination. Uh, this charge for just cause would just be like breaking the law, habitually absent, immorality, that type of stuff, which that, you know, that makes sense there. But when it comes to unilateral termination by the board, so if the board is, somebody brought up evaluations, if the board is upset with the direction of which the school is going or doesn't feel like the director 
is um, following policy as they're putting it out or anything like that. If the board decides to dismiss the director, as it's stated, he's just in, he or she, whoever it is at the time, will just get paid out uh, their benefits, they'll get paid out their salary. We saw this happen uh, with the previous director, which I also brought up, which is F, uh, unilateral termination by the director through resignation. Even though he resigned, he still got paid out. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that if we have one employee or one contractor, and that's what we keep being told, that we don't have any real say over top of that. There's really no incentive for him to follow us other than, like was mentioned here, I, I mean, I think he's doing a great job, but I'm just saying in general, a contract, um, I just couldn't possibly get on board with the potential of what happened with the previous director. So my wish that, I'm, you know, during our discussion at the work session, you know, some kind of compromise. And right now, if uh, the director, let's say, were to be, for whatever reason, unilaterally, something terrible happens, the board were to get rid of him, and uh, that would happen this June, then we'd be on the ticket for the next two years paying for this director, and then we'd also be paying for our new director as well. It was already experienced once. I thought the last contract was horrid. I, I was very vocal about that, um, even though I didn't have a a place about that. I didn't even like the timing of how it happened right before an election. I agree with that here again. I don't like the timing here as well. Um, we are not even the year two into a four-year contract. I don't see the need to have this conversation right now. It's nothing to do with Dr. Sullivan, like I mentioned before, said many times. It's not personal. Um, didn't like the contract previously. Don't like the contract now was told it's the same contract, read through the contract side by side. The only thing that changed on the contract was the grievance part, which I didn't quite understand why that was happening either, and neither do I support that. But it would be great if, as a board, we could come to a compromise and maybe look at uh, 90 days severance, three months, something, something along those lines, which is I think is very fair for the salary, the benefits, the amount that goes with the director. Um, I think that's a way more fair decision for this board rather than just keep repeating the same mistakes that have been made before. Now, thankfully, um, we haven't had any issues. But you got to be prepared. I'm not going to sign a contract that keeps me trapped. So I'm just asking the board just to consider those options. Maybe we can have discussion. I know there's a motion on the board, so there would need to be an amendment. But I would just ask that, I mean, that's not a heavy consideration. I don't even know. I'm not going to ask Dr. Sullivan personally. We're talking about his contract. It feels weird to be talking about his contract right in front of me, but I guess it's the way that it is. Um, or otherwise, I would have asked him and see if he would have been okay with that as well, uh, adding that in instead of the way that it's currently written. It is very, very heavy director favorite. So, Ms. Rosales. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring up his performance evaluation a year ago. Um, last year, in his first year, he scored an overall 4.43, but I also, out of a scale of five, but I also want to point out where he scored the highest. He scored the highest on the administrative survey. And it shows to me that that same support is here today because I believe all these principals and administrative office, people that are sitting in the audience here specifically for this extension to see it come through fruition is because they still support him and they scored him a 4.52 out of 5. And we were told that he scored the highest in that section in, the, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, in that it was a, a historic Thing to have a superintendent in the first year to have a high scoring in that area. And to that, I want to read some of the comments that were said about him in his job performance, in his leadership. <clears throat> Dr. Sullivan has done a wonderful job and really listens to teachers and administrators. Dr. Sullivan 
has done an amazing job in his first year as director of schools. I believe he is on the right path to ensure the continued accelerated success of our school district. Dr. Sullivan has made connections across the school district. He listens and hears all voices. System employees feel valued. Dr. Sullivan has done an incredible job in changing the culture and supporting employees during his first year. This builds a sense of mutual respect, which incentives our dedication to our jobs. We want to work harder because we feel respected. Dr. Sullivan has made a tremendous difference in administrators' trust and stress level within our district. Dr. Sullivan's emphasis on transparency, engagement, <clears throat> and service is much appreciated. I am very optimistic about the leadership under Dr. Sullivan. Excellent first year. I do not believe these comments were manufactured just for the sake of manufacturing comments. I believe these comments were made because these people truly believe that in that leadership that he has. And we can talk about the contract all day long. But one thing about this contract, it was already negotiated from the very beginning, which I was not a part of. And my understanding that when it did get passed, it was a unanimous decision to pass that contract. And it's a mutual contract between two parties where it was already agreed upon. To go back and ask someone who's had an amazing year with amazing remarks from his um, direct, the people that report to him directly, I don't understand why we will go back to something that was already agreed upon on two sides because at the end of the day, even if we agree to this, he has to agree to it. He has to say yes or no. And he's not, he doesn't have to agree if he doesn't want to agree. And on top of that, when we saw yet um, Tuesday, when it came to um, showcasing the salary wages across the state of Tennessee, we saw that even the starting salary where we're at, we're not paying nowhere near what should be paid for this job with the amount of students that we have. So um, I, don't, I believe it's a fair contract. If you were in any corporate situation and you were getting laid off, you will get a severance package. And that package includes whatever the amount is where you had, were hired for the to end whatever the contract and situations. So that is no different paying out, is no different what will happen in a corporate setting. So all that to say is that I believe that if we want to incentivize him into staying in our district and not walk away, it is by extending the contract leaving the way as is with the terms that were done all the first time when they were negotiated as in good faith to say, Dr. Sullivan, thank you for your hard work. Thank you for what you've done into this community. It's pretty evident. It still shows that you still have the support that you had a year ago. You have it now. So therefore, I as a school board member will love for you to stay two more years. In fact, if I could, I will tell you stay longer than two years, but you're only asking for two years. And as in good faith and in good service of your hard work and dedication, it's an honor to extend the contract by two years. Anyone else? Um, Mr. Young? I think that's where we get lost at. When we look at this sometimes, all we're doing is extending two more years, giving them the, the original four years he had in the contract to begin with. So we haven't done anything outside the original contract. We're still within the, the original contract that we offered Dr. Sullivan. And used to, we could operate on a one or two year contract because a lot of these directors would come in at the end of their career and they just wanted it for a couple of years to help their retirement. We're, we're taking a different path with Dr. Sullivan. We're trying to recruit somebody that's gonna be here long-term that we don't have a lot of change over. It will be good for our system. So it only makes sense if he's willing to, to work here another two years, that we offer him his contract. Anyone else? I have a motion on the floor. Ms. Brown. Yes, sir. I, yeah, I, I agree with uh, some of what's been said, but uh, just to clarify a few things. Um, one, I mean, yeah, he, he's a younger director. Thank God for that. 
No, there's no problem with that. But as far as this being the original contract, I wasn't on the board when this contract was signed. So this is a brand new contract to me. If, if it had just been carried out continuously, then um, it would have just been carrying on until the extension came up. But because the extension's brought up, now I have to look into it and my name's gonna be tied to it. So that changes things a little bit for me. He's not locked in either. I know that that was mentioned as well. He can, he can retire tomorrow, he can move on to somewhere else. This is, this is not something that just keeps him locked here. And Dr. Sullivan, to my knowledge, did not ask for this. So it's not that he's just asking or, or begging for it. As part of negotiations, um, I'm sure he welcomes it. Why wouldn't he welcome it? It's very favorable. But that is not the, the pure reason for this. So nothing's really changed for me. I'm, I'm still asking that the, with the motion on the floor, if there would be an amendment to consider the 90 days. Uh, as, as far as, oh, one more thing I forgot. Uh, as far as the salaries go, the, the governor of the state makes about less than 250,000 and he's over 7 million people. So comparing salaries and, and, and all that different stuff, I, I don't think we need to get into that. Um, as far as what would make me more likely to move forward, I would say if we could put out there that instead of being locked into this thing from whenever something happens, if it were to happen, maybe nothing happens, maybe it's great, maybe we, we're renewing him again in four more years, um, that'd be great. But in case something does happen, I'm not locking myself into a situation that happened with the previous director. So stop bringing up the previous director, please. Well, I mean, please, please. Okay, I mean, that's I mean, enough, Ms. Bryant. <laughs> that's enough, Ms. Bryant. I want to, I want to make something clear. I also did not bring this extension before, and the way this worked is because there were board members that brought this before. So, um, it's it's really um, interesting to hear some of the comments because there were board members that brought this before and now we're scrutinizing this contract and I didn't, was not the one who brought this contract. So I just want to make that clear. Did, did you want to, I don't exactly know what you want to do, Mr. T. I'm asking if the board would consider amending the contract. Do you amend. want to make a motion to, for an amendment? It will have to be a motion. I think she has to withdraw hers. I'm no, she does not. Oh, not so I, if I get a, a motion and make an amendment, for an amendment, and I get That's a second. That's what you can do. Okay. I would like to make a motion that on the, where's Jeff? Hey, Jeff. Um, on the unilateral termination by the board, that we could change this portion to where if the board were to unilaterally resign the director, that they would only have to pay out 90 days of the contract instead of paying out the entirety of the rest of the contract, no matter where that happens in the contract. That's a motion to amend, correct? Motion That's to a amend. motion to amend. I'll need a second. Second. Did you say second? Second, yes, ma'am. Have a second. We Madam have to vote on the amendment before we vote on the motion. Coy had his finger up, sorry. Okay, Coy. Madam Chair, I don't know a director in Tennessee that would accept a contract like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I would like it's in to, every I director's contract that I researched. I would like to ask Dr. Sullivan right now, would he even accept just a two-year contract? Coy, I prefer that we do not ask him directly because... Point of order, you don't have recognition from the chair, Ms. Rosales. Ms. 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 Bratton. No, ma'am. Just one second. Let Mr. Young finish. Go ahead. I think I already know the answer, but I don't think Dr. Sullivan would even enter into a two-year contract. Uh, I think that was the reason we entered into a four-year contract initially. Uh, I don't know of any director in the state of Tennessee that wouldn't want to be bought out for the, com the whole contract. There is no 90-day or anything like that that I've ever heard of before. That's true. On the school board. But... Let's make sure I do this right because this is going to get convoluted if I don't. I have a motion for an amendment. So the motion for the amendment has a second. We have to a vote on the amendment before we vote on the main motion. 
unless Ms. Rosales is willing to add that I to. All right. Madam Chair, Chair will be voting on the amendment. Can I, would Dr. Sullivan entertain a question before we take that vote? I, I don't think so. No. No. We're just not going to do that. We're going to vote on the amendment. Sorry. And we're going to have a roll call vote. Roll call vote, please, on the amendment mm -hmm. to change to 90, is it 90 days? 90 days, yes, ma'am. Mr. Tidwell? Yes. Mrs. Darby? Yes. Mrs. Maxwell? No. Ms. Sharp? Yes. Mrs. Rosales? No. Mr. Young? No. Mrs. Bratton? No. We will now move to the original motion, is that correct? You do, yes. Would you repeat your original motion? Uh, <clears throat> I move to approve the contract as presented. That's the motion. I had a second. Second. From Ms. Maxwell. Did you get that? Is there any more discussion? Ms. Bratton? Yes, ma'am. I just want to make it clear that the way this worked is because we had board members that came to the chair requesting to add this extension and they're in now is being scrutinized. I think it's horrible that there were board members that brought this to bring this just to scrutinize the contract as presented. I want to make that clear. And I was not the one who brought this to the chair to extend the contract. Thank you, Ms. Rosales. Are we ready Madam to Chair. Yes, ma'am. It was my understanding that you brought this extension. Is that not correct? I did not. Okay. Good to know. I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but no, I, that's not. fine. I was just I was under the impression that you had brought it to the. You had the wrong impression, Miss Darby. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready to vote? Yes. All right. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Tidwell. No. Mrs. Darby. No. Mrs. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Sharp? No. Mrs. Rosales? Yes. And Mrs. Bratton? Yes. The motion passes. We have extended Dr. Sullivan's contract for two more years. Thank you. Thank you, board, and thank you to our staff that's here. Appreciate you guys. We will move to number six, approval of the consent agenda. I will give you a few moments to glance back through the consent agenda. Did you have something you needed to add, Dr. Sullivan? I did, and I don't believe it is on C. The board has it handwritten, so I received an additional nepotism request today, so it's to add Brian Smotherman and Inclusion E8, Oakland Middle School. We can wait till the next two weeks to add that, but I'd request that we go ahead and add it. One um, is an inclusion EA. The spouse is a EA in the school as well with no supervisory roles. So I'd request that we add Brian Smotherman. And then we added Amy McCann from Correct. Tuesday night. Okay. Anybody else have a question or comment about the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Thank you. Move to approve and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those say no. Anyone wishing to abstain? Motion passes. We will now look at public comment. Number seven. <clears throat> um, Kevin Lawhorn. 
Mr. Lawhorn here. I don't see him either. No, I don't, I don't think he's here. Um, Robert Brooks, Mr. Robert Brooks. Mr. Brooks, you've spoken to us before, so you know about the lights and whatever. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Sullivan, board members. I appreciate the time. I stand before you tonight. I stand before you uh, in complete opposition to the proposed policy that seeks to limit parents and the public from addressing the board solely to agenda items during our school board meetings, allowing parents and taxpayers to be able to voice a concern <laughs> before the school board is not just a matter of courtesy. It is a fundamental right enshrined in our Constitution. I recommend that board members be held to the same standard and be allowed only three minutes to speak on the agenda as well, as this would create brevity and fairness across the board. I implore you to reject any policy changes that would further limit public participation in school board meetings. Let us instead reaffirm our unwavering commitment to democracy, ensuring that every voice has an opportunity to be heard, that every parent has a feeling that they belong in their community, and that they have someone that's leading the charge for them in the community. I, as a parent, I love the fact that I have a voice. I love the fact that I can come here and be able to speak to you about different things. As a matter of fact, I was just having a conversation with Dr. Ferguson in the back of the room. I came to her, voiced the concern, and she dealt with it. That's in our schools. So if we can do it in our schools, it needs to happen here. I find it deeply troubling that uh, a so-called Republican board member the other night in the work session decided to ask about who added something to the agenda in a humorous way and who approved it. When it comes to parliamentary procedures, we are supposed to do things in a correct manner. There is an order that is correct. God has established an order in his word. And when we say that God established order with his word and we bring it into this room, then we must operate in that order, just like we do in our homes. As a man of God, I stand firmly in the fact that I, too, have order in my home. But that's where it starts. And when we walk out of our homes, it goes with us. Now, while I expect such limitations from the Democrat, any Republican who supports this proposal should immediately resign and be expelled from the Republican Party. We, the community, hold those of you supporting this in contempt. Because if a vote for yes on this policy, you are holding our Constitution in contempt. And that is just not favorable for the people. We are supposed to be for the people, for the public. You are voted on to sit in these seats to take care of your people. Thank you, Do Mr. It. Brooks. Our next visitor is Sarah Schmidt. Ms. Schmidt, there's lights. Do you know about those? No. The front? Okay. When you start to speak, the green light will come on. You have three minutes. Okay. There will be a warning light, yellow, when you get to one minute, and then when Makes the red sense. goes, your Thank three you. minutes are up. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm a new resident here in Laverne, and I've learned some disappointing things going on in our schools. As a taxpayer, lover of freedom, and free speech, and longtime parent-child advocate, Today, I'm, I'm addressing just one concern, which is the same as the gentleman that just spoke, um, proposed policy 1404. I don't see it listed on the agenda today, but thankfully, I'm free to bring up my concerns as my schedule allows. Please vote against this policy. We must all fight to maintain freedom of speech and the right to address the school board concerning any topic regardless of whether it's specifically listed on the current agenda. I understand that some of you may think this will streamline meetings to stay on topic. 
However, this is a step away from open communica communication and transparency, placing more control in the hands of the school board instead of parents and taxpayers. I've seen firsthand that, give, that giving governing power an inch, they take a mile. I'm guessing most of you have seen that too. On March 22nd, I requested a response via email concerning each board member's stance on these proposed changes. I quickly received responses from Ms. Darby, Ms. Sharp, and Mr. Tidwell. I finally received a fourth response yesterday after 4 p.m. from Ms. Bratton, simply thanking me for my opinion. Freedom is not an opinion. I received no response from the other board members, including Mr. Young, who represents my zone. Disappointing, but telling. I've heard we need to go through an appropriate channel, which includes contacting our board members so that our concerns can be addressed to be added to the agenda. That lack of response concerning this policy and my email is proof that this process is not working. Listen to your constituents. You represent your community, not yourselves. Parents and taxpayers deserve transparent and honest representation. We don't need unnecessary, unnecessary policy aimed at stifling our voices. This is not blue, this is not red, this is not Democrat, this is not Republican. This is being able to come and tell you our concerns. I urge you to vote against proposed policy 1404. Thank you so much for serving and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Number eight, Rutherford Proud. Dr. Selden. So it's my honor, Whitworth Buchanan Middle School has been named a 2024 Blue Ribbon Schools of Excellence Lighthouse School. Principal April Sneed is here to provide a presentation explaining the award designation and process of school completed to earn this designation. Um, and she's coming up just a little bit about kind of the school. So going back to 2019, so under the school accountability model at that point, <clears throat> Whitworth Buchanan Middle School was a targeted support and improvement school. So one of the bottom 10% performing schools for subgroups and overall performance in the entire state. During that April of 2019, I think I actually have the entire team that was here. So I just was not official in curriculum and instruction yet, had just been named. And Ms. Haley, Ms. Powers, and Dr. Martin were assigned as the acting principals to go serve during the transition of April and May. <laughs> from Whitworth Whitworth-Buchanan till Ms. Sneed took over on July 1st. And so to have di district office have to go and help run a school doing cafeteria duty, morning bus arrival um, to where we are now. And I know that you have several, I see that you have your assistant principals, Mr. Butner, Ms. Cousins, Ms. McIntyre, I think I saw, yep, she's right there. Um, you have several of your, I think all of your coaches are here as well. Um, so, and several of your staff and faculty members, so. Thank you guys for your work. I remember the conversations we had five years ago, and I can't believe it's been almost five years ago to the day, but the work that you guys have done. We talked about it on Tuesday night. Most of our, our Blue Ribbon schools are schools that are magnet schools. And to be able to have a traditional performing school, especially one just five years ago that was on the state takeover list, if you will, um, in short five years is a testament to your team and your leadership. So thank you. Thank you. And if my school will stand, please. I say all the time, this is not about me. I know my name is on the agenda, but there is a team behind me and a team beside me, and we work together to make our school the best learning environment for our students. So uh, we have a few people representing us here today, so thank you. So as I, as I said, this recognition is the result of the hard work of our entire school community. Uh, we work together to meet the needs of our students daily, and we keep that at the forefront of, of our work. Um, I do have behind me two members of our team for Blue Ribbon. Uh, that's Mr. Butner, Assistant Principal, and Laura Davis, Instructional Coach. 
Um, and we're here to just tell you a little bit about the Blue Ribbon process. Uh, we won't take much time, we'll be pretty brief. Um, but the Blue Ribbon process is a national uh, validated assessment process. It's a comprehensive review of nine performance areas of high performing schools. And those indicators are listed um, on the screen. They start with student focus and support, school organization and culture, challenging standards and curriculum, active teaching and learning, technology and integration, professional community, leadership and educational and education vitality, school, family and community partnerships and indicators of success. So it truly is everything about our school and what makes a school successful. Um, so I'm going to have Mr. Butner and Ms. Davis step in. I'm going to give them part of the points that uh, Blue Ribbon Process uh, did for us. And I'm going to step out of the way. Um, as Ms. Sneed said, it was a very uh, thorough, comprehensive, and intensive process. Like, that was very impressive to me. And I really feel that the assessors got a very good picture of what with Whitworth looks like, even though they aren't from the state. Uh, so I'll kind of go over how we had to prepare for the visit and what they did when they visited. And Ms. Davis is going to jump in and talk about what their feedback was and what we had to do to earn that distinction of a lighthouse school. So the work for this began months in advance of the visit. Um, they gave us uh, documentation that we would need to gather and collect and provide for them. And it ended up being about 300 pages of documentation. And it listed things, everything from our master schedule so they could see logistically how the day runs, how we set up our blocks for our ELA and math, our SPED schedules, our ESL classes, to our state report card data from the past three years. So they looked at the procedural and logistic information of the school, but also the data that shows the effect of what we're having on student learning and student growth. Um, while we were gathering that data, about a month out from the visit, we would then had to send surveys out to different stakeholder groups. And that included our administrators, they, we all participated in that, our teachers, our paraprofessionals were in their own category, and then also our students took the survey, as well as our parents. And so the Blue Ribbon process really impressed me because they are very interested in the opinion of everybody who is involved in the school, all the stakeholder groups. So that survey, it was pretty extensive. It had about 110 indicators in it that were grouped into those nine categories that Ms. Need had uh, posted uh, previously. And some of the items would be um, posed to all stakeholder groups. So for instance, there's the category of leadership and educational vitality. And one of those items was uh, the principals moving the school toward accomplishing its vision and its purpose. And so what I kind of learned about the process is what they're looking for in that survey is you know, it's one thing if us as administrators say, yes, we have a vision, and yes, we're moving towards that. But if our parents and students scored that low, to them, that's kind of a red flag. And when they came to visit, they were going to be looking for data that would show why that was a red flag. But for us, you know, on that item that did go to parents, as well as our staff and our students, uh, we received a 2.3, excuse me, a 2.6. It was a three-point scale. Anything above a 2.0 is an area of strength for the school. And so that... It was very enlightening to see that like, you know, our parents, and our, even our students, realize that we have a vision and that we're moving towards that. And so it was a very interesting process to engage in and to hear all the feedback from the community. After we admitted, uh, excuse me, administered the surveys, then the uh, assessors came to visit the school for two full days. So during that time, they conducted focus groups. So in addition to the survey data, they met with groups of parents, they met with groups of our students, as well as a group of our leadership team of our teachers. And then they posed two questions to those focus groups. They would ask them, what makes Whitworth Buchanan a great place to learn? And then they would ask, if you were given a magic wand, and they kind of posed, money is no option, no obstacle, um, what would you add, change, or delete from Whitworth Buchanan Middle? And so they collected that data. And so once they had those two pieces of data, they then hit the ground and were in our classrooms. And they covered a majority of classrooms in the building, ranging from core classes to elective classes, intervention classes. ESL to, uh, to look at how we're serving our English learners. Again, they were very focused on examining every aspect of the school. So this, I cannot stress enough that this is a very intensive process that we go through to prepare for this. So once they had all that data collected, they gave us areas of strength from what they found from their rubric, and they also gave us areas from growth. And then in turn, we had to respond to that feedback to then earn that distinction of being a lighthouse school. And so Ms. Davis is going to jump in now and explain, once we got the feedback from the assessors, what we did that ended up earning us that distinction. Thank you. Good evening. 
So my part was once we got the documentation showing us our areas of need, um, I'm happy and pleased to say that out of those nine performance categories, we actually had six that we were already at 80% or above on. So we met six right off the get-go from the um, binder that our coaches put together to the on-site visits that they collected. So we had three that we had to focus on and there were two pathways there. For those pathways it was either provide evidence that we were doing those indicators or implementing strategies but what we recognized in the indicators that said they were areas of need that our teachers and our students were already doing those. They were things such as projects and before and after school support parent communication. We knew that these things were already happening, so the next part of that was actually submitting the evidence in the document that the assessor sent us. So we, the coaches, collected all the evidence that the teachers, we knew they were doing through being in their classrooms and PLCs, that we were able to submit that evidence. And I am happy to say that within a matter of two weeks, the assessors got their committee together and we got a fancy sheet of paper with our school's name on it that said, congratulations, you have been named a Blue, House, Blue Ribbon School Lighthouse School. Um, so I'm so pleased of our faculty, students, and staff. They've just done an incredible job and we were tasked with just putting the evidence together of the great work that our teachers and students are doing. Um, in closing, we will be able to receive the award next fall at the Blue Ribbon School Conference. And the additional piece of that is for any of our schools in the district or nation, one of the commitments of Blue Ribbon Schools is that we are to mentor them through this process. So any, any schools, principals out there listening, if you are interested in this process, we are happy and pleased to help you. Thank you. Have a good evening. So I know we have several people who will still be on the board at that time. We should have a board meeting on that day, December 5th, because it's the first Tuesday, Thursday of the month. We're probably going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, so I'm going ahead and give you a six, seven, eight month heads up, because um, the director gets to go to those, and I want to make sure that I'm there. So That's great. Congratulations again. Thank you so much. Ms. Brutton. Yes. I'd like to say, this is truly a, remar a remarkable story. Uh, I mean, there's not there's not enough emphasis that Dr. Sullivan could put on what the turnaround the schools had. I'd like to thank Miss Need for her leadership, her team for backing her up, and uh, the work that you guys are doing. You really are setting the standard, and I'm just so thankful for that. Sure, I'm glad I hired you, April. <laughs> <laughs> but did you teach her? I did not. Okay, <laughs> missed that one. If only I could have gotten there, though. <laughs> Number ten, legal. We have an out-of-county transfer student listed as number one. The board's been requested to admit a transfer student from another school system under discipline. The student was remanded to alternative school for possession of an infused gummy or an edible. According to policy 6.318, the board may deny admissions of any student except those in state custody when a student transfers from another school system while under suspension or expulsion. Director of schools recommendations to admit and place into alternative school. However, you have either option available to you to admit or deny the admission of this out-of-county transfer student as presented. And you did say we have a room. Yes. Okay, that's always a consideration. I will take a motion. I move to admit and place into the alternative. Second. I have a second from Mr. Tidwell. Ms. Bratton? Yes. I have a question before we vote on. Okay. Can we discuss the motion. The motion? Yes, because we just did a motion. Oh, okay. And yes. Getting ready yes. All roll. Yeah. Um, Dr. Sullivan, I have a question for you. Um, do we have room in the alternative school? Because yes. You know, last year, yeah. that was a problem with that. Yes, we do. Um, okay. All right. I just want to know if we had room or not. Yeah, Thank we you. do. Sorry, you didn't hear me. Yeah. I must oh, have mumbled. Oh, you said that? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. But I'm, I may not have it loud enough. I, that's oh, okay. okay. Yes, we do have room in the, in the school, so we're oh, okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. All right. So, anyone else have a question? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Anyone wishing to abstain? We will admit and place into the alternative school. Number two, central magic, magnet HVAC problems. I saw Dr. Where's, Ash. Where's Dr. Ash? Did he run? 
You know, so I, we've been talking a little bit about this over the years. So Central Magnus experienced multiple problems with the HVAC renovations that have been done over the last several years. The system that was installed is not functioning as we requested. The cost to repair the system will be significant. Um, there may be legal re recourse against the engineer, contractor, and or manufacturer who worked on this system. We have a recommended motion to authorize Board Attorney Jeff Reed to bring legal action against the companies involved with the HVAC system and to seek appropriate remedies. I will add we do plan to go ahead and put this in our budget to go ahead and address and then seek back some of the cost for fixing that system so that we can go ahead and get it taken care of. Questions or comments on this? Um, Ms. Sharp? Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is, are we gonna put a, um, a limit on what we can spend on attorney fees on this? Mr. Reed. Uh, we, until you file a suit, you don't know what kind of defenses are going to be raised, so you don't really know how much time your, the case is going to take. What I could do is brief the board in executive session once the case is filed to see what kind of responses and answers have been filed, and we can discuss the merits of those or lack of merits of those and the, uh, what our standing looks like to be in the case, and the board can decide at that point whether you want to proceed with it or um, take some of their action, settlement, something along those lines. In executive session. In the That's executive what I thought session. you said. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, we don't want to spend a lot of money on attorney fees when we can put that toward a new air conditioner. I get that we need to address this situation at Central and, and the company that did that, but I think we also need to look and somehow say we're not going to spend over X amount of money because it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. We do not want to waste money on this by any means, um, uh, but I think there is significant concern with respect to the companies that were involved with, with this HVAC system. But we do think there may be some liabilities there. And the board has already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to address these issues. And I think the board is looking, I mean, I think the school system is looking not only to recover some of the monies that is already spent, but to also spend, to recover some of the monies that it's gonna to cost to fix the system. So, cause you're looking at, you know, it's, it's multi, I mean, it's over a million dollar item. It's not a sure. small yeah. item. It's not. When do you think you could be back with that information? Approximately. Uh, we have to prepare a complaint. The complaint has to be served on the defendants. The defendants have 30 days to answer the complaint from the date that they are served. And um, at that point, um, we was get started with discovery, interrogatories, or, you know, depositions, that type of thing. There'd be expert witnesses also involved in the case. So. Um, you won't really know kind of where you stand in the case probably until you're into it for a few months. Is there any way they just may come and settle? Because the um, evidence is pretty... It's, it's possible, but um, until you file the complaint, they really are probably not likely to settle anything with you. Okay, other questions? Mr. Young? Do we have a ballpark figure of what the total cost would be to make this system right? <laughs> we're continuing to have issues with this system that's installed we think we have the mitigating problem of the moisture uh, high humidity uh, under control at this time uh, we're probably going to recommend uh, adding an additional fresh air system uh, similar to what we've done at Stewartsboro and uh, Rockville Elementary this year. That system is around three to four million. Um, and that would be a supplement to what we've already got there. Um, and the system that we put in was five million. No, it's about four. But we've spent some money on the mold remediation as well. Right. So Dr. Sullivan. So I was gonna ask, what did we spend? About 250,000? Uh, no, about we go over. that. Okay, I knew it started at 250. Yes, sir, that's where it started. Anyone else have a question? Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay, wait, I need a second. Second. Second, all right, did you get that? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Anyone wishing to abstain? <clears throat> the central magnet HVAC motion passed. 
Number two, financial matters. First, we have Wilson Bank and Trust contractual agreement. So Wilson Bank and Trust contract is an agreement between Riverdale High School, Riverdale High School Quarterback Booster Club, and Wilson Bank and Trust for a donation of 150000 distributed over a 10-year period. And this helps pay for the turf. Recommended motion to approve or deny a contractual agreement of a donation from Wilson Bank and Trust to Riverdale High and RHS Quarterback Booster Club as presented. Questions? Ms. Maxwell's ready to answer any of those for you. <laughs> Just kidding. No, Tamara's back there. If we need anything, we'll, we'll get you right. Anyone have any questions? I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the contractual agreement of donation from Wilson Bank and Trust to RH and to RH Quarterback Club, RHS Quarterback Club. Second. Second for Mr. Tittle, thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Anyone wishing to abstain? Number two. Number two, this is kind of the basis of our budget for this year. We have our certified and classified 2.5% COLA salary schedule adjustment for 24-25. Um, our staff is used to hearing that as a percent raise, but we're calling it a cost of living adjustment. So the recommended motion is to approve the certified and classified 2.5% COLA salary schedule for 24-25 school year as presented. Okay. Before we begin this discussion, I am disclosing that I do have relatives that work in our district. I, however, will be voting for what's best for our district as a whole. Mr. Young? I repeat the same. Mr. Young says the same thing. Now, questions or comments on the 2.5% raise? No questions or comments? I will take a motion. Move to approve. Second. Move to approve and second by Mr. Tidwell. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Anyone wishing to abstain? You may clap. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Can I add one thing to that? You certainly may. So just so that our staff is aware, um, <clears throat> every position except for the director's position also has a step increase connected to it. So every individual, if they're classified, every classified staff person has a 1.6% increase to that. So it's really a 4.1% raise. Certified's a little different. It's 2.5% plus whatever year you're on. So it ranges from, what did I say the other night, Mr. Trill? Was it three, three and a half? Three. Three, three to a 0.25, depending on what year you are. So. Okay. Next, number three. Next, we have the COSPA convention. Um, or no, sorry, talking about the COSPA convention. The COSPA convention runs around 16,600. The board did not attend COSPA this 23-24 school year. Uh, Mr. Arby would like to discuss opportunities of attending a few programs in place of COSPA. The first one is Newcomer School, so that's in Charlotte, North Carolina. Just some proposed dates. I think you were open to any dates, really. That was just a proposal, correct? Mm -hmm. And so that price per person is approximately $650. The second one's the Polaris Career Center in Middleburg Heights, Ohio, and that price is approximately $500. So recommended motions to approve or deny any combination of the above programs as presented, um, but not limited to the approximate cost. So if it goes over just a little bit, we still need to be able to do it. Questions, comments? Ms. Sharp. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got to quit raising that little finger. I can't see you. Um, so, um, <clears throat> actually, Ms. Maxwell uh, was the one that wanted to, to look at the newcomer school. Uh, it was the ESL. She was the one that we had discussed. They have a, a complete different system than what we have in their school system. Um, and I think with the ESL that we have, this is something that we need to look into. Um, and with the Polaris Center, which is a CTE center, we've, we've been talking for the last couple of years now about doing CTE hubs. I think it would behoove whoever wants to go, to go and not, maybe not the whole board, maybe one or two for each one, go and, and look at this because we're gonna, be, we're gonna be looking for things to address the new students that are coming in here and we need to address the CTE. I'd like to ask a question, Ms. Darby. Yes, ma'am. And this is just something that occurred to me. Did you think about asking maybe Ms. Turnbow or Tyra Pilgrim 
to go and check these places out for us and come back and do a presentation? I did not, but I am more than happy for anyone that would like to come with us that's involved in those areas to come. Well, I'm just, interested. I'm just thinking, <clears throat> you know, they really have the expertise, the knowledge, they know what they're looking for. We, we would know what we were looking for, but we probably wouldn't catch all the little nuances mm -hmm. uh, of two places. So I was just wondering if there would be a, a suggestion to send Megan Turnbow and Tower Pilgrim on these rather than the board. Ms. Bratton? Yes. Can I? Well, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were done. Sorry. So right, just to, to bring up why Ms. Darby asked for this. So there, I, this got brought up, I don't know, six, seven months ago, maybe. It's been a while. It's been a while. Um, and ultimately, this policy is in 1.204. And so it says in 1.204, basically anything that is outside of the norm of TSBA, COSPA, anything like that has to have board approval for board members to be able to participate in. So that's why it got brought up. As a separate item. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bryant, thank you. So, <coughs> Ms. Maxwell was not the only one that was looking into this. In fact, the reason why Ms. Maxwell knew about the Newcomers Academy is because I was there at CUSBA with Ms. Maxwell talking to the um, school board member who is at North Carolina who has the highest popula population for ESL. And that's where we discovered by asking questions that I asked about where that they had this um, Newcomers Academy. And when we were looking into going down to North Carolina, Dr. Sullivan came to us and told us that we had to put this on the um, agenda for board approval. But I would, like to tell, I would like for Dr. Sullivan to tell what did I say when you told me that we needed to put this on the agenda. I hate when you guys put me on the spot. Sorry. You had asked to put it on the agenda, and I said it needed to go, and I believe you said something to the effect of, I'll just pay for it myself. Exactly. I said that I did not believe it needed to go before the school board to get approval for me to use taxpayer dollars to go on a trip that is not um, really necessary to use that when it can be repurposed for something else or for our staff to go down to North Carolina and use that instead. So if we're thinking about going down to these places, I believe that this should come out of our own pockets. Um, we were elected officials. This is a sacrifice. We weren't hired. We were not employed. So it's totally different um, reasons for us um, for those reasons, I believe that this kind of spending should come out of our pockets. If this is something that we think that is necessary, I don't believe that we should ask more approval and use taxpayer dollars to send us to trips across the United States, because it could be a lot of trips at this point. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, first of all, yes, Dr. Sullivan would have been included in going with one of us board members to, to look at this. and. Ms. Rosales, you and I went to Kentucky, and, they, and it was paid for yeah. by this board because it was information. Right. That's called continuing education, and everybody does that. Well, and Ms. that's right. just like COSBA. That's why we have these opportunities. And it would be derelict of duty if we don't start looking into some of this and try to get ahead a, a of these 10,000, 11,000 kids that are coming up on the North End. We can't just sit here and continue. And, You know, if it's your idea, it's a good thing. But if it's somebody else's idea, it's not. And you don't want to spend taxpayer money. Ms. Thank Martin. you. Yes, ma'am. First of all, when it came down to that trip, I did not want to send a reimbursement for it at all. Well, then I was for it. And I was for it. going to send a reimbursement. I even said I was not going to send reimbursement. But you were the chair, and you told me I had to send the reimbursement. So let the record be stated and said it that I did not want to get reimbursed for the trip to go to Kentucky. So with that being said, yes, we do have a problem with a lot of things that are happening right now. But as an elected official, it is, I do not believe that we have to nickel dime everything to show that we are doing our job. If we talk about taxpayer dollars, which the board members love to bring up, this is the time to do it. You're talking Should about millions, and we're more? talking about maybe a thousand. It's sixty, Madam Chair. It is not. Miss Darby. It is not. Girls, okay, let me ladies, clarify. Miss Darby, 
The $16,000 is what it cost us to go to Cosbo last year. That is not how much these trips are going to cost. That's number one. Number two, if you want to go and pay for yourself, anyone that would like to go and pay for themselves, by all means. I don't really want to get into the dirt on people's personal lives and their finances, but not everybody up here can afford to spend $500 plus dollars every time they have to go somewhere, plus time away from their jobs, their families, et cetera. So I don't think it's an argument that needs to be had. Everybody can have their own opinion. And with that, I'm going to make a motion to approve any board members that would like to go. I will say that I will get with Dr. Sullivan and any board members that would like to go on dates, as well as any central office staff that he would like to see attend with board members. Do I have a second? Second. And a motion and a second. Do I have any more discussion? I, since uh, we talked about this, uh, we've had a Zoom call, and yes, they have 32,000 ESL students. I can't even wrap my heads around this. Um, I think it's a great thing, and I'd like to go see the, the situation. I don't mind paying it for myself. I'm, I can pay for that. I definitely think that we need to make sure that some of our staff go. Megan needs to go see the Newcomer Academy in person, and I think Dr. Sullivan would be great if he came as well. Um, I don't care about paying for it. I, I, I do see Ms. Rosales' point. Um, we are always asked by our governing funding body to be lean and mean. And so, but I do believe that we should spend the money to send um, Megan and Dr. Sullivan. And if somebody else wants to go, they can go. But I, I don't know that, you know, we all need to go or even three or four of us need to go. We have a motion on the floor in a second. Calling for a vote. Let's take, let's take a roll call vote, please. Mrs. Darby? Yes. Mrs. Maxwell? No. Ms. Sharp? Yes. Mrs. Rosales? No. Mr. Young? No. Mr. Tidwell? Yes. Mrs. Bratton? No. The motion failed. Number 12, naming of new schools. Um, we had a report by each of our chairmen for each of our school naming, but I would like for them to do it again because I don't think everybody hears what we say on Tuesday night. So, um, Dr. Sullivan, you want to start and have our people report out, please? Ms. Sharp, I think you were our first one. Roy, the former Roy Waldron Annex. Yes, the Annex, y'all. The Annex, not Roy Waldron. Definitely the Annex. Uh, definitely the Annex. Uh, it used to be Laverne Primary. My son went to school there. Um, so we are proposed Simon Springs Community School because it's not going to be just an alternative school for um, certain SPED. And it's not just going to be a SPED school, and we're not shipping off our, all of our SPED students to this location. I want, I, look, I just need to set the record straight. We're talking about 20 students that, ha, that need just a little bit more attention, and we hope to work with them and get them back into gen ed. And um, we would like to do some other things with the building as time permits. And Bob... Um, Simon was a great leader in Laverne. He wanted to build a community center. However, he passed before he saw that dream realized. He, I believe he was an insurance salesman and he was um, a member of Box 100. If y'all know what that is, Box 100 goes to the scenes of accidents and supports our first responders. And he was a beloved uh, Laverne community member and his family is super excited about this as are we and we have chosen the fox as the mascot and metallic silver silver and burnt orange for our colors okay i'll entertain a motion so move so move do i have a second, second. all right you want to read the motion to us okay it's to approve or deny the naming of the former Roy Waldron Annex 
to Simon Springs Community School Fox mascot and colors as presented. I'm going to say you say approve. Is that correct? Yes. To approve. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed no. Anyone wishing to abstain? We have now named the Roy Waldron Annex. Next. Next, we have Westbrook's Woods Academy, and I believe that was Ms. Maxwell. Um, this school, I'm very excited, is going to be uh, on Church Street and is in the heart of Murfreesboro. So we are hearkening the name back to two people that were instrumental in education in uh, this uh, city. Hollis Westbrooks was mayor when I was a little girl, and he was mayor, and I apologize, I don't know how many years, I just know it was a lot of them, because he was mayor for a long, long time. And he also was chairman of the school board uh, from 1942 to 1956, also a very long time. And uh, he was just a wonderful man. Uh, he was responsible for everybody that likes Cannonsburg, he's your guy. And uh, he even, they even had an old general store from back where he, he lived that he brought onto uh, the property. And uh, he loved this, this city, and he loved Murfreesboro, and he was a very good man, and uh, he's had several things. The Westbrook Towers is also named after him as well. And uh, there was another lady that kept coming up. Her name was Olivia Woods. And uh, so we decided that instead of just naming it after one of them, why don't we use both of their names? So that's how we came up with Westbrook's Woods Academy. Olivia Woods was the first African-American graduate of MTSU. She spent 30 plus years teaching at our city schools and her husband Collier was the one of the, uh, was also, an, uh, his last job was one, as an assistant principal at Central High School. So uh, they're just both wonderful people and uh, we decided that we would call, our mascot would be the Admirals and that our colors would be another homage to uh, uh, Murfreesboro, MTSU blue and white. So I'm very excited to uh, put the motion to approve uh, the naming of the former Church, Church Street property, Westbrook's Woods Academy. Second. With the Ad Admiral's mascot and yes. the colors as presented. Yes. Questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Anyone wishing to abstain? I I'm going to. I'm just going to stop and ask, is Butch Vaughn still here? Mr. Vaughn, did Collier Woods teach at Holloway? That's what I thought, before he came over to, to Murfreesboro Central High School. Okay, I thought that was right, but I just wanted to make sure. All right, the next one. Next, we have our new school, so formerly with the Beatty property, and Mrs. Darby, that one's all yours. We had a very lovely meeting with Mr. Beatty and got to hear a lot of history about his family and the land. Um, and we settled on Poplar Hill Elementary School because he spoke about the poplar trees that sat on top of the hill and they always called it Poplar Hill. Everybody liked the ring that that gave. He was, just so everybody knows, we did discuss names. He did not want his name attached to that school. Um, I just don't think he felt comfortable with it. So. <laughs> Um, we went with coyotes, and our colors are hunter green, white, and metallic gold as an accent. Would you like to give us a motion, Ms. Darby? Sure. I will move to approve as presented. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Anyone wishing to abstain? And I want you all to know that Ms. Darby knew that there were 10,000 hunter greens out there. <laughs> So she got the exact color, and we have the exact number of the hunter green that will be used at this school. I thought greatly that was, appreciated. It really is greatly yes, appreciated, because <laughs> if you had ever been a cheerleading sponsor, you would know what I mean. You got to get the right color of blue, red, and hunter green. That's the result of being a printer's daughter, too. That's exactly <laughs> right. I, I knew that was where you came up with it. You knew there were 10,000 hunter greens. All right, number 13. Insurance, Dr. Anthony, do we have any idea when the state's going to give us projected rates for the increases for this coming year? Uh, a little bit later. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> usually, usually finds that out later yeah. in April. After the budget's already passed, usually. That's Got of course. It. That's yep. not good. Yep. Okay, there we go. Uh, number 15, yep. director's so update. 14 and 15, I'll combine. So we did a, 
a pretty long look at TISA and our revenues the other night at the work session. One other thing that I want to point out, I want to thank Dr. Martin and then Shannon Groom as well. So they and Patty Easter has been working on Stop the Bleed kits. And so we're a little bit over 250,000 to put one in every single classroom. We're gonna go ahead and hopefully purchase enough for our new schools as well so that we have that kind of covered. We're going to be looking at donation type things if any community partner wants to be involved, but we also will look at some of our extra TISA money because that was something that wasn't budgeted, but we have fast growth TISA money that we can use for those things as well. So should have those in place in every classroom by August. So that's our goal. Thank so, you. Director's update, two things. First, you have, uh, we have for the last, oh, at least three or four years, been working with um, Commissioner Craig Harris and the Opioid Abatement Board. So the last couple years, we have used the Botman Life Skills Curriculum. Um, there was some disagreement back four or five years ago about whether the board approved that or not. And so we're looking at changing our curriculum to the HOPE curriculum. Um, Jenna Stitzel presented yesterday to the Opioid Abatement Board um, at 9 or 10 o'clock. Dr. Chastain was there as well about our new curriculum, and we were fully funded. What the HOPE curriculum stands for is the Health and Opioid Prevention Education Curriculum. So Health and Opioid Prevention Education Curriculum, we are working to get a full copy of that so that the board could have that to possibly approve for April 18th. Dr. Chastain, do you have any other information about scaling, sizing, all that type of thing? The plan after meeting with the abatement board is to have it in four elementary schools and the, the lessons are all differentiated by grade level. So it's grade level appropriate, follows our standards within the health curriculum. So four elementary schools, four middle schools, and all high schools. So that's kind of where we landed. And yes, we absolutely can provide that curriculum for all the board members to look at. And then the last one I want to talk about is we've had questions about reconsideration of library materials. And so just to kind of remind everyone so that we're fully aware of where we are, we have policy 4.403, which is reconsideration of library materials. And basically there are two avenues for a book review and challenge. The first one is through our library review committee. We have 11 members set up in policy 4.403. Um, part of that policy is we review one book at a time. We've had two reviewed so far. I emailed the board last night. We had three additional ones, and so we're starting on one of, of those in the next couple days. There's a couple state laws I want to highlight. First is Tennessee Code Annotated 49-6-3803, which was passed, I believe, in, for implementation of the 22-23 school year. That was where the, each LEA has to establish their own library review committee, which I just mentioned. There is one part of that, though, that is very important for some of the questions that we've had, and that is Section E. In Section E, and I'm going to just read it verbatim, the procedures adopted pursuant to this section are not the exclusive means to remove material from a school's library collection and do not, and it goes on and talks about charter other agencies, and do not preclude an LEA from developing or implementing other policies, practices, or procedures for the removal of materials from a library collection. And so that gets to the second part of our policy. There's a second state law that um, addresses obscene materials, and that is Tennessee Code Annotated 3917-901. And in 901, they define and codify what obscenity is described as. And so we've had two different avenues that we've been looked at to review books. Um, the other part of that that doesn't get mentioned a lot, and I've talked to our librarians and media specialists about, is it, we don't take that lightly in looking to remove or challenge library books, but it's also making sure that content is appropriate for our students. And the second part is making sure that our media specialists are following the law and they're protected. Uh, TCA 3917-911 goes into consequences for lending materials, and one of the consequences can, can result in a misdemeanor charge. I don't know that that's happened anywhere in the state. I sure hope it hasn't, um, but that is the, something that's there that I have to be aware of. Um, in all, so I think through that avenue, we've had 32 books submitted. Um, the first one, 10 were removed. Um, the first list, all 10 were removed. We had a second list of 10 submitted, um, eight of the 10 were removed, two were kept, and we have 12 right now that were recent. Uh, three were either removed or not present in our library, four were removed, 
three were retained and two were still under further review for 32 total. So we had a request to discuss kind of what our process was um, and what we have looked through. So those are the two kind of avenues that we've looked at for library books. Just wanted to make sure I could add one more controversial thing to talk about tonight. <laughs> Anyone else have a comment or question? All right. Ms. Rosales, you were going to give us an update on what happened today. Yes, I have some really exciting news. Um, today is a very special day. For, um, for starters, um, sorry, um, it's special because um, I didn't realize how impactful this position can be. And um, I never dreamt that something could happen in the way that it did. And, and why it's even more special is because this day is very special to me in the sense that this was the day that my nephew was born in 2017. And um, he was born with a very rare genetic disorder. And unfortunately, he passed away when he was three months old. And he was the only, he was the first person that was diagnosed with it. And it's called, you know, Ezio syndrome. And so it's, um, it's special because today was the day that also the bill that I had been working diligently for the past um, year to require safety training for all substitute teachers, including um, active shooter training, actually made it to the House floor and the Senate floor today, and it got passed unanimously on both sides. And now it's going to be continuing on and making it its way for the governor's and um, office. And so what's also even really cool is that we got, I received a special shout out from, um, from Representative Stevens. So I really want to call out uh, um, Representative Stevens and Senator Don White for getting behind this and um, pushing it through. And then there was another bill that got passed as well that Ms. Sharp also um, championed, and that was to, uh, for the, um, for kids that are singing, you know, even if it's a joke or whatever, but just taking the seriousness of it, of, of a threat of any kind, uh, will, depending on how it lands, they will get a, uh, a tiffer, stiffer penalty, and it, it will take a year off, like they will take a, a year of privilege of their driver's license. So that got passed um, as well today. And she also got a, Ms. Tammy Sharp got a shout out from the floor by Representative St um, Stevens. Again, we'd like to thank Stevens and White, Senator White for, um, for their hard work and diligence in trying to get this, these bills passed. So it was very um, momentous and historic day for Rutherford County and being part of presenting legislation. And then there's another, legislation that I've got to follow up and I believe it's going to be passed and it's the um, the bill for removing in that extra testing in the summer camp for third grade retention because it doesn't meet it doesn't serve a purpose there for adequate growth so that uh, was a result of uh, of setting up meetings with the right stakeholders, including the representatives and senators, and then having our Dr. Chastain and the whole team, Elizabeth especially. Kudos to Elizabeth, who uh, last year, it was a nightmare working through all of that. I mean, I don't think people realize the amount of work that our central staff office do in supporting the whole entire district, because it's a lot of work. Um, and she needs to be very commended because she's the reason why we're getting this um, bill changed. Can I hit on one thing with that? So Ms. Davis is funded out of ESSER, so y'all are going to see a request for her position to be funded. Yeah. So oh, okay. I wanted to make we sure we didn't make Thank you for yeah. letting us know, telling us that. Um, well, she's definitely earned her keep. <laughs> um, so that, so as a result of that, um, Stevens heard what we were saying and. Um, went back to Nashville and filed a bill that will remove that extra test for um, that is not really needed. Um, so that's going to be passing. And there's other things. I know right now um, the committees are trying to wrap up and trying to, they're trying to, and they're trying to wrap up and close the committee so that we could, they can go ahead and go to the floor and pass the bills, whether pass, approve, whatever. Um, the update on ESA, I know everybody loves to talk about this. Um, 
that bill right now is at the um, Judiciary Committee for the House. Um, there's three different versions. I don't know if anybody is following it. They've got the governor's version, the House version, and the Senate version. I will say that the, the Senate and the governor's version are the most aligned, comparable, and a lot, little bit more cleaner. The House version is very different. Um, it also includes um, a fiscal note of $250 million that includes some different things that will, um, that will go towards education. So there is going to be more activity right now. They've kind of put pump the brakes a little bit on the House and moving forward with the, the ESA because um, they're working on something else. And I forgot what it was the other something else. But it's, um, it's kind of not moving right now. It probably will pick up in the next couple of weeks. So that's my opinion. When, when are they going to be winding this down? Well, I mean, they're probably going to be winding down right towards the end of April. Okay. So, so it's coming it's up. End of April. It's coming up. Yeah. They're winding now. I mean, they're ready to close the committee. The, I believe the education committee, if I'm not mistaken, because I didn't watch it, um, if they didn't go through all of their bills on the consent calendar, then um, it may still be open one more week. But as far as what they're going to be, as far as the consent calendar, that's closed. No one can come in and put any more bills. That was closed two weeks ago. So right now, it's just what's left over in the consent calendar that they are hearing and proposing. But as far as filing and adding to the consent calendar, that window of opportunity is closed. I'm just curious mm -hmm. for the budget position of it so that we can have an idea of hopefully by the end gotcha. of April. Yeah, that's what well, we're watching. Well, they're on the budget right now. I, that's what, that, thank you. So they put the pumps and the brakes on the, the ESA because they're working through the budget for the governors. So they're picking that up. And I think when it gets to a certain spot, they're going to go back to it. But it's, it's coming. I mean, it's obviously they're not going to, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to speak for the misspeak for the House and the Senate because anything, anything goes. Anything is game. Anything is fair. That's comforting. <laughs> General discussion. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the uh, law that Representative Stevens passed. It was a law against children, our students, making threats against our school because we know what the learning loss causes uh, when you go through that day. So there is a stiffer penalty or stiffer, stiffer sentence. It's a felony now, but they also, if they don't have their driver's license, their driver's license is delayed. So um, maybe we didn't really want anything that was financial because then the parents just end up paying for it and the, the children don't really see a cause and effect in that because their parents usually just take care of it. So hopefully the children will see you know, they're not going to get their driver's license or they're going to be delayed in getting their driver's license if they make some social media threats to our schools. We have to find, we have to find some way to deter them from doing that. So that was our purpose. And I think uh, Representative Stevens, we, we sent him a lot of resolutions this year and he, he did us a solid. Um, we, we knew he probably wasn't going to do anything on vouchers. We submitted it anyway. We did. But, um, you know, that's, we know, we know what time it is on the Hill with the vouchers. So, but um, the secondary um, Jazz Fest need some volunteers and uh, if y'all know any companies uh, Claire's on the board uh, uh, Katie's on the board I'm on the board for um, donations but we still need some to get us across uh, the finish line and we need some people to sign up to help uh, with parkings and things like that and I've got to sign up Jeannie it's on the, uh, my uh, school board Facebook page so if anybody wants to do that and it's really fun and you get to hear great musicians when we were at Whitworth Buchanan today we went to the auditorium and heard their first year jazz band and I'm going to tell y'all they were they were Excellent. So if y'all aren't doing anything on the 26th and the 27th, y'all need to come down. Uh, there's plenty of restaurants down there to eat. Uh, Friday night's going to be a little bit different. Maybe um, there is no restrictions on um, alcoholic beverages. There are some restaurants there that serve it. Uh, but the jazz is going to be at night, and we're going to have our seniors and everything. Not our students. Not our students, but their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Let me clarify. Not our, not our students. Um, <laughs> 
because I do know people who like to listen to jazz, they may like to have a little vino or something like that. So, but uh, it's a little bit different from last year, but y'all please come out and support our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. We have some phenomenally talented students and not just in football. And I, they, they tell, tell them again how they can donate or volunteer. Tell them where they can go. Okay. Uh, Oh my gosh. On your page, right? I have my page, but is it BurrowJazzFest.com? Borough, borough yes. Sounds BurrowJazzFest.com. Borough okay. Sorry, it's been a long day. Or, or you could call us. Yeah. And, and us. we'll come and pick up a check. Yes, we'll, we will. We'll drop whatever. We'll move we heaven and earth to pick up a check. $50, $500, we will take it. Just don't put Tammy Sharp on it. No, right? Just it needs jazz to go to okay. uh, gotcha. Carpe Artistry because they're who handles uh, all of our donations and everything like that. So the board members who are involved in this, we don't handle the cash at all. We don't see it. And Ms. Sharp's really good about just about once a week, you'll pop that back up to show everybody. So just keep looking if you can't find it. And we'll take all it's checks be, and donations right now. It's going to be great. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Tidwell. I just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, we had a, a winner from the Amazing Shake program, which is my fa one of my favorite programs. And with this many principals attending, I wanted to go ahead and put that in their ear. If you're not doing the Amazing Shake program, I hope that you will consider joining. And I was going to ask Mr. Evans, if uh, was it 46th place? I think it was 47th. 47th place. And I can't remember that national. Or global. Is that, it's global. Global. 46th uh, place. They have competitors from countries across the. Now it's Rocky Fort Elementary. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Elementary. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. I think it's Maria. Uh, congratulations to her. And please consider looking into the program. It's an amazing, amazing program. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say it's prom season, but it's absolutely the best time of the year for the SPED community at their high schools. Tomorrow is the special ed prom, and I'm going again. It is the most fun. Those children have the best time, and they ride in style. <laughs> so I just, I, I just hope we get some pictures and uh, can bring it back. Uh, James, are you sending uh, anybody there to take Ms. pictures? Ms. Raglan is covering tomorrow. very excited. The theme Wonderful. is Taylor Swift. Right? Taylor oh, Swift. Wow. Hey, Tay. Oh, Our, uh, we'll see. I'm going to have to pass uh, on that Our one. special education Ms. coordinator, Ralston maybe. And she is dressing oh. in her era of what? What is your era? <laughs> <laughs> glitter makeup will be involved, though. So, and I don't want to short Maria. Maria Alvarado scored 46 globally, Mr. Tittle. Ah. 46 Very good. globally. Are there tickets still available? Are there tickets still available for the prom? Yeah, what? We'll, okay, we just we'll need to, Okay, so half where? Price, where? Half price. Okay, what time? Thank you, Ms. Darby. Into one. Ten o'clock. 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 I'd get there closer to. At three. To, if you're title one. Late, it's ten to one. I would get there closer to twelve than closer. We're to talking about a.m. Right? A.m. Yes. 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 Okay. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because, but well, look, prompts are later. I'm so. But this is, we, this we is during school. Okay. We have three title one meetings. Yes. yes. I know. We'll just have to spread it out. Mr. Young. I just wanted to. Publicly apologize to Ms. Smith for not returning her email. I am behind on emails, text, and phone calls, but uh, that's no excuse, and I will be reaching out to her. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sullivan? Um, the other one with Ms. Maxwell to hit on is we talked about Tuesday night, but Every Kid is a Hero Day is April 10th mm -hmm. at Stewart's Creek High School. So. Yay. Anybody else have one to announce? Any principal have anything to announce? Ms. Darby? I don't have my mic on. I would like to wish Ms. Tammy Sharp a happy birthday today. I was wondering when you were going to say something. <laughs> You're not as old as I am, Tammy. Keep going, girl. He's not going to let it pass by. It's a big one, y'all. It's yeah. a big one. Oh. <laughs> so a very special happy birthday to her. And with that, I move to adjourn. Uh, Ms. Maxwell? Oh, second. <laughs> we are adjourned. <laughs>